Joining us by phone, Cory Doctorow, author of his latest, Choke Point Capitalism, which he co-wrote with Rebecca Giblin, how big tech and big content captured creative labor markets and how we'll win them back. Uh, Corey, welcome back to the show. Oh, thank you very much. It's lovely to be chatting with you again. Happy New Year. Thank you. Happy New Year to you, too. Um, all right, let's just start with this. I mean, well, let me just start with, with, with this is, you know, I, I, I want to go through these, the, the various, I guess, sort of like examples that you guys used in the first half of the book of, of uh, to describe what choke point uh, capitalism is. But um, I, I just, the, the Prince thing, I never, I lived through this. It never, like, I, I, you know, like, it was sort of always in the background. Like, he changed his name. I just assume, oh, he just did that because he's trying to be wacky. But that wasn't it at all. We're talking, of course, about the musician. Let's just start there, just because I was like, uh, I, it was, I, I was like, oh, my God, why didn't I ever even even contemplate why he'd done this? Uh, but walk us through, sure. like, why Prince changed his name as an example of what um, is now, I think, much more even widespread than it was then. Yeah, and, and I'm going to try and do this without getting into too much eye-watering detail. The the book that we wrote, Choke Point Capitalism, we kind of spend the first half unpicking these very Baroque scams, you know, where, where kind of John Oliver-style uh, dissection of these different kinds of accounting frauds. And the record industry is rife with them. It, it's, you know, the, the point of going through all of these is to realize that they're not uh, hard to understand because they're complicated. They're complicated precisely so that they'll be hard to understand. So the, the record industry has long been a source of very bad contracting terms for artists. And, and, you know, part of our thesis in the book is that it doesn't really matter how much copyright you give to artists if there's only a couple of labels and if they demand that you just turn over all that copyright to sign to them. And, and Prince is a very good example of that. So just as with most other artists, Prince had to uh, sign away all of his rights to, to sign up with the label. And he had to finance the production of his own music. Uh, when you sign a deal with a label, you get an advance that's supposed to pay for your rent, your groceries while you're recording. Um, and then you also are, have charged to your account all the expenses associated with that recording. So they tell you what studio to use and what engineers and what sidemen. And they charge you for all of that, often at rates that they get to determine and often rates that are much higher than market rate. And then you start earning it back. And you earn it back in the form of royalties. And the royalties are extraordinarily low. Uh, they were better for Prince than they were for, say, the Beatles, who got one penny per LP that they split four ways, minus 15% for breakage and 10% for their manager. But they were still extremely low. And what that meant is that Prince could make millions and millions of dollars for the labels and still owe hundreds of thousands of dollars for his, or even millions for his production. Um, what's more, Prince had recorded a lot more music than the labels would allow him to put out. Uh, and so he couldn't even earn back the money that he had paid in and they had a lock on his masters. And so he, let me just, let me just, I, I just want to yeah. tease that part out here so that people understand what that means. So he's in going into the studio, he's pumping out, importing them. The studio doesn't want to use them on the album, but they're still charging him for producing them. So they're not allowing him a, the ability to make money off of those things that he's paid for. And B, you know, from an artistic standpoint, he wants to release, he can't release them. And so it's just having gone down there and done that extra work essentially cost him money and he didn't even get the, like the, the artistic, uh, he didn't get any artistic value out of it. Yeah. So the labels, you know, back in those days before we had uh, streaming digital music, the, the labels really wanted to control how much music there was. There were these physical limitations to uh, how much music you could sell that were in the form of record bins and CD bins at the record store and the space they had at the warehouse. And they just wanted to, to time the tempo of releases so that they could um, manage and maximize their return from all of this stuff. And Prince was an extraordinarily prolific guy, a you know, brilliant and talented musician. And you know he wanted to release more than he had. Now, it's interesting because when digital came along, not only did it free us from some of that tyranny of, of physical space, but more importantly, provided a competitive hedge against the labels. That, that you know, when digital came along, the labels started paying more ro royalties. They started cleaning up their worst accounting practices. Some of that was actually due to um, some legal changes. So after the Enron meltdown, we got uh, Sarbanes-Oxley. And Sarbanes-Oxley established criminal penalties 
for corporate executives who signed fraudulent accounting forms. And so before that, it had been a, a common practice to run an off the books third shift at the CD pressing plants where they would press another round of CDs that would just never show up in your royalty statements. And they could sell those without giving you any of that money. And after Sarbanes-Oxley created criminal liability, personal criminal liability, jail time for executives who signed off on those statements, that practice ended. But, you know, as the tech sector became much more consolidated and started to look a lot more like the record industry, the two became really indistinguishable. It's like that last scene from Animal House where you look from the pig or not Animal House, Animal Farm, where you look from the pigs to the men and the men to the pigs and you can't tell the difference. And that, you know, really reaches its apotheosis with Spotify, which is a tech company that's owned in significant uh, measure by the record labels. And so it's just it's the fusion of tech and uh, entertainment. And they use all the tricks that tech has and all the tricks that entertainment has to screw over the creative workforce that produces the value for them. Has it gotten worse? I mean, because, I, you know, having had been in uh, show business at one time uh, and, and aware, particularly in the context of like movies, it was much harder for them to do this with TV. But uh, some for some reason, it was much easier for them to do it in, in movies because they there was a lot more sort of like places they could spend money on marketing. But it always feels like you get residuals or any type of like back end on on any of these things. The by the time they're done accounting, no movie seems to have ever made a profit. Well, you know, in some ways, this is just uh, uh, like a reflection of a phenomenon that's happening all over the world. So every sector has become super concentrated. You know, there's two companies that make all the athletic shoes and three companies that do all the shipping and all your beer comes from two companies. And, you know, w one company makes all the eyeglasses in the world. So, so, you know, this is true also in the entertainment sector. And wherever you see these monopolies, you also get what economists call monopsonies, difficult uh, word, but an easy concept. A monopoly is when you've got one seller for a good and, and a monopsony is when you've got one buyer. Monopsonies are particularly bad for labor because you are selling your labor. And so if there's only one buyer for your labor, then that buyer can set terms. And in the entertainment industry, there are so many choke points that these monopsonies have created that wherever you turn, there's someone sticking their hands in your pocket. So we tell a story in our book about the Writers Guild here in, in California and in Hollywood that ground out a 22 month strike against the talent agencies. All the talent agencies have been rolled up into four giant firms, two of them owned by private equity companies. And they restructured the standard deal so that instead of taking 10% of what the writer got from their negotiated contract, they started to take um, a packaging fee from the studios. So they said, oh, we're not gonna take a commission out of the writer. We're gonna package the writer, the actor, and the director all together for a single project and we will get a fee out of the studio. And the less money they accepted for the talent, the bigger that fee would be. And in the golden age of television, when you had all this like high budget Netflix and other streaming TV coming out, uh, the uh, income for writers shrank to the point where some writers discovered that their agents were getting 90% and they were getting 10%. And worse still, the agencies were starting to set up their own uh, studios. So they were gonna negotiate with themselves on behalf of their writers. The writers gave the agencies seven days to clean up their act, to sign a code of conduct. And the agencies, all four of them refused. And then on one day, all 7,000 writers in the Writers Guild fired their agents and grounded a 22-month strike that culminated with the absolute capitulation of all four of the big talent agencies. And, you know, that, that story appears in the second half of the book where we address ourselves to solutions to, to this problem. And it's not the kind of individual solutions that you get in those chapter 11 books. It's like 10 chapters of how things are screwed up and 11th chapter about how you can vote harder. Right. It's, it's detailed technical systemic proposals, labor unions, changes in contracting law, changes in competition law, changes in our tech law that will make sure that the distributional outcomes of entertainment labor markets result in creators getting more money for their labor, not just more copyright, but more money to pay their rent, more money to pay for their groceries, more money to put braces on their kids' teeth. I, I want to go through uh, some of those uh, solutions and also, uh, you know, talk about why I it's important for the, the sector and, 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 and also, you know, how this model is not just, um, uh, does not just simply exist within the sort of more creative fields. Uh, but let's, let's talk about, I mean, I, I think, I think people understand the dynamic that goes on with Amazon uh, but let's just briefly go over like what they did with books. But uh, the Audible stuff is even more, I think, sort of 
um, uh, is even more um, I- intense of more concentrated. Well, I guess literally concentrated, but also as a story of this dynamic. Yeah, sure. So Audible, you may know, it's, it's Amazon's audiobook division. They control about 90% of the audiobook market in the major genres. Uh, and they have an ironclad policy that if you want to distribute your book on Audible, you have to allow Amazon to wrap that book in a proprietary encryption scheme, a digital rights management scheme. And under uh, a Clinton-era tech law, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, under Section 1201 of that act, it's a felony to give someone a tool to remove DRM. So what that means is that if you buy my book on Audible and then someone offers me more money if I start selling my books there, I can't give you a tool to follow me there. I can't give you a tool to convert your Audible books to just MP3s or to play on some other set service. Only Audible can authorize that, not the copyright holder. And so as Audible has been able to lock in more and more of its suppliers, right? It's, as it's been able to use its monopsony power, it's been able to turn the dial so that we creators get less money for our products and Amazon gets more money. And one way that it does this is by locking in its customers through a subscription scheme. If you get a subscription scheme to Audible, you get a credit every month that you can trade for an audiobook. And if you have that subscription, at least until recently, you could return that audiobook at any time for no questions asked, even months after the fact, even if you had listened to it several times over and you would get your credit back and Amazon would encourage you to do it. After you listen to the audiobook, they bombard you with emails and pop-ups and messages on their website saying, hey, if you didn't like that audiobook, you know you can just get your credit back and get another audiobook, which makes the subscription more valuable. It, effect- it effectively allows their most avid customers to treat Audible as a library and check out as many audiobooks as they want with a one credit subscription, which would be fine if Audible was paying the bills. But every time you returned a book, Audible clawed back the royalty from the creator. And they especially did this to creators who used ACX, which is their self-serve platform for independent creators, creators who had to sign away the right to produce their, uh, to put their audiobook on any other service for seven years. It was an exclusive deal and who had the least negotiating leverage over Amazon because they were just individuals or small publishers. And, um, they were not told how these royalties were being calculated. What they would see is that they had only sold, say, 10 copies. And what they wouldn't know is that they'd sold 25 copies. And Amazon had inveigled its customers to return 15 of them and had taken back that money from them. And that went on until there was a glitch that showed three weeks worth of returns all at once. And these writers turned around and they said, how did I sell negative copies on the platform? And then they got their explanation. And this kicked off something called AudibleGate. And uh, Audiblegate was started by a writer in Perth, Australia named Susan May, and she roped in writers from all over the world, including a writer in in the UK who was a recovering forensic accountant who had uh, gotten burned out of the industry and started writing mysteries about forensic accountants, thrillers. And and she said, you know, I'm going to go look at this because there's never just one cockroach. And she went and she checked. And not only were they clawing back the royalty once, they think she thinks that they were clawing back the royalties twice. And that also, they weren't calculating the royalties the way they said they would. They were giving you even less money than they said they were. And she did a bunch of detailed math, and she thinks that there's hundreds of millions of dollars in wage theft from Audible uh, against its creators, against its creative workforce. And what's more, if you as a listener are disgusted by that, and you quit your Audible account, you can never listen to any of the audiobooks that you paid for again. And so this is, I mean, it, it, they're getting it both ways. And that, in many respects, that's the the idea of the choke point, right? Is that they're, they're, they're choke point both from, the, uh, from the, the content producer and a choke point from the sake of the audience. The audience is roped in, the content producer is roped in. And there's this dynamic that you, you, you talk about that, you know, with the Amazon, it really is the most sort of, I think, explicit. We're going to create a... Um, uh, you, you write about uh, Amazon set out to create the uh, to to aggregate the audience so that it would force the yeah. suppliers to to aggregate there and then basically lock everybody in. Uh, it is amazing, though, to think about the idea that like so I could I could read your book, not yours, <laughs> but, this, but I could I could listen to your book, let's say on Audible and uh, and then enjoy it. Think it's great. Return it. And then it's as if the author never sold the book. 
Yeah, that's really amazing. And yes, as you mentioned, my books aren't typically for sale on Audible. There's there's a couple funny exceptions, though. The big one is that we took the chapter about why Audible is a scam, uh, the audiobook chapter about how Audible steals from writers, and we made that an Audible exclusive. <laughs> so you can go and get that from Audible. But it's the only part of our book that you can get there. We ran a Kickstarter to fund uh, an amazing audiobook production because, you know, obviously publishers don't want your audiobook rights if you're not going to sell it on Audible because that's 90% of the market. We raised about $100,000 and pre-sold a lot of copies and, and got this amazing reader named... Uh, uh, Stephen Rudnicki, Stefan Rudnicki, I beg your pardon, who you may know is like the voice of Ender in the Ender's Game audiobooks. He's won a bunch of Emmys and uh, Hugo Awards and so on. He's got this incredible voice, and you can get that audiobook anywhere that's not audible. So Google Play allows you to sell books without DRM, and you can get it on Libro.fm and Downpour.com and Bandcamp, and you can get it from my own store, craftbound.com slash shop. And in all of those places, it's sold without DRM. Um. All right, so let's talk about um, uh, let's talk about YouTube a little bit. I mean, and uh, and and I think we're going to be talking to. Uh, I know you 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 cover Live Nation. I think we're going to be talking to uh, some folks from the American Prospect who just wrote a big uh, uh, piece about Live Nation. Um, and but let let's talk about YouTube in terms of like uh, choke points there. Yeah, well, YouTube, you know, is is an example of how. Uh, going to sleep on antitrust law for 40 years allowed companies to grow not by being great, but by being rich. So Google uh, is a company that has only made three successful products, right? They made a, a really good search engine, a pretty good Hotmail clone, and a browser that's great to use, except that it spies on you like crazy. And everything else that they tried to build in-house failed, including things like Google Video. And all their successes, including their whole mobile stack, their ad tech stack, their server management tools, all of it are companies that they bought from someone else, including YouTube which is a service that they couldn't compete with. And so they bought, as, as Mark Zuckerberg notoriously once said in a memo that has come back to haunt him, it is better to buy than to compete. And YouTube has got this incredible lock-in as well. It has the same kind of uh, uh, aggregated audience that it gets by self-preferencing within the Google ecosystem. So, you know, Google puts YouTube links at the top of its search results and so on. And it also has a lock on the advertising market. Google and uh, Facebook together control about 80% of the display advertising and search advertising market. And they have rigged that market. Uh, the Texas Attorney General uh, case against Facebook includes the public, or rather against Google, includes the publication of the infamous Jedi Blue memos, where Google and Facebook got together to rig the ad market, which means it's very hard to sell ads or buy ads without buying them from them. And they skim off 50% uh, or more once all the fees and so on are, are calculated in. So if you're a creator, you really have to be on YouTube. It's very hard to be anywhere else. And um, in the early days of YouTube, the studios and the labels really went nuts on YouTube and, and uh, sued them like crazy in lots of different ways. The most notorious one was a Viacom lawsuit where they were seeking to, to put YouTube out of business and then assimilate it as, an, as a division of Viacom. There were a bunch of uh, internal emails published as part of that lawsuit where all these little prince links within Viacom were arguing among themselves about which one would get to run YouTube once they'd, once they'd uh, broken its back. And um, as, a, as a consequence of these copyright cases that were brought against YouTube, YouTube voluntarily introduced this thing called Content ID, where anyone can upload, uh, uh, anyone who's in the service can upload a, a clip and say, this is my copyrighted work. And if you hear or see anything that looks like this being uploaded into YouTube, um, I get to control it. I get to decide whether it can be published at all. And if it is, I get to take all the money that's generated from its production. And there are lots of ways that this has come to harm artists. So you're, you have some artists who Im invest a lot of money in producing videos on YouTube, only to have unscrupulous third parties come along and file fake copy strikes against them. And if you get three copy strikes against your account, it's terminated forever. And so these guys will file two fake copy strikes against an artist and then come back at them and say, if you don't want that third to hit, then you're going to have to pay me ransom. You're going to have to pay me a share of your income. And as we know, you're never going to reach anyone who's a live human being at YouTube to, to actually sort this out. There have been a couple of high profile cases where YouTube caught these guys, but you have to imagine there were lots where they didn't much more uh, above board and, and well understood is what happens to classical musicians. So if, you, if you're a classical musician, you're performing uh, compositions that are long out of copyright, hundreds of years old, 
And the definitive recordings of most of those belong to one of the big three record labels, Sony. So 70% of all the recordings in the world are owned by Sony, BMG, and uh, Universal. And they got those not by investing in them, but by buying up other labels at fire sale prices during various economic downturns. And Sony has uh, put content ID uh, strikes up for all of the classical performances of all the classical music. And if you're a pianist at home on lockdown, as many were, or a musician at home on lockdown and uploading recordings and hoping to monetize them through your Patreon or through an ad or through um, uh, selling music lessons or what have you, um, you would find that your music was being taken down and that you were getting copy strikes or being demonetized and your money was being harvested by Sony, which managed to claim effectively a kind of pseudo copyright over every performance of these public domain recordings. You could contest their claims, their automated claims, but Sony would often come back and say, no, uh, this is really our copyright and we insist that you, uh, uh, you YouTube demonetize it or, or take it down. And, and, and to be clear, there's no validity to that claim. It is just brute force at that point by the, um, by the, by the, the copyright holder of a different performance. Yeah, that's right. It, it's basically that, um, it, you know, if you are someone who, who knows senior executives within Google, you can get stuff done. And you will often see this happen on social media. Back, back when Twitter worked, you would often see people who had high profile accounts being petitioned by their fans to say, hey, I'm a small time classical pianist. My music was taken down by Sony. No one at YouTube will listen to you to me. You've got a much bigger account. Will you retweet this? Or, you know, I, I know you, I saw you once did a talk at Google. Could you email the person who booked you in and see if they would forward a complaint to someone at YouTube so it'll be looked at by a human being? And whereas if you're Sony, you've just got like a person whose phone number you have at right. YouTube. And so you can solve your problems with well, a call. I'll, I will say this, that, that, you know, when, um, at one point we were getting, like when we would do the show, we would get, we kept getting copyright strikes on YouTube from, uh, I think it was AP UK or Reuters UK. And it was for stuff that mm -hmm. like, we, we got this from C-SPAN. We got this like, you know, this is not what we're, and we didn't have, like now we have like a representative that I, I can email and say, Hey, why did we get this copyright strike? Sometimes it's because we've said stuff that is, you know, they, uh, well, we don't get copyright strikes any that much anymore, to be honest with you. Uh, but the, that changed. And that's just because we got, you know, at one point, a million you subscribers and when we got the guy yeah, and, uh, your, yep. your average person doesn't have the opportunity for this at all, but isn't part of this also a function of these, uh, particularly like Facebook and, uh, YouTube not wanting to spend money on actual content moderation. And it's just all mm. based on like, sort of like they're trying to save money. Well, I'm saying in terms of like the way that these things get that, that broken. I mean, I know there's other aspects to this, but in this specific uh, instance, there there's just no people working there to do this because they don't want to pay for those people. So it's definitely the case that um, if they paid more people to investigate these moderation claims, um, that more of these moderation claims will get cleared. But I'm skeptical that a, a meaningful number of them could get cleared. I think that if you hired every copyright lawyer who was ever born or whoever will be born, that you would still not be able to adjudicate every copyright right. question that arises out of these giant platforms. The problem isn't just that they're understaffed. The, it's it, just like the problem with, say, Facebook is not that they have an insufficient number of people to kind of go through the three ring binder in which they've expressed the policy for moderating the conversations of three billion people speaking a thousand languages in a hundred countries. The problem is that there isn't a binder thick enough or a workforce large enough to make sense of that project. It's a, it's a fool's errand. And by allowing all of the video to get aggregated into this one platform, which is not a, a market function, it's not that YouTube was the best, it was that YouTube was the company that was bought by the company that could leverage its search dominance and its ad dominance and its other forms of dominance like mobile to become the, the, the dominant video platform, now only to be challenged by, by TikTok, which has its own set of, of uh, 
uh, unfair competitive advantages, most notably the, the fortunes and power of the People's Liberation Army and the Chinese Communist Party, that um, it, it was able to, to uh, you know, get this dominant position such that its failings become so important. You know, as people start to rethink whether they want to be on Twitter, the, the problem of Twitter is becoming is coming into much sharper focus, which is not merely that Twitter made mistakes in how it moderated its content, but also that if you didn't want to put up with those mistakes and you quit Twitter, you quit something that mattered a lot. Right. It, it became the one conversation that mattered a lot to a lot of people for emotional support, for news, for access to emergency services, for conversations with people they love or for an audience, for a creative laborer. And um, and what that meant was that those mistakes mattered in an enormous way. A and just like when we allow our country to dwindle to four airlines and then one of them turns out to be Southwest Airlines during Christmas week and they cancel thousands and thousands of flights. That is a, a huge problem in a way that it wouldn't be if we still had 25 airlines. Right. right. And Southwest's were just around the margin. For one thing, when Southwest started to cancel all those flights, American Airlines was able to start charging $10,000 or more for one-way tickets that were domestic coach because there were so, uh, so many people who were scrambling to get on and it had all that pricing power. So, you know, one way to make companies less harmful is to, make, is to take away their power to do harm. And, uh, it, you know, not just to make them work well, but to make them fail gracefully. And graceful failure means that you just can't be that important, right? It's that, that by allowing these companies to amass these monopolies, we allowed them to become so structurally important and so unmanageable that it was inevitable that they would fail and that those failings would be very consequential. Right. I mean, that's, that, I, that has always been my sort of take on Twitter is that the, the issue is um, it, they shouldn't be a town square. <laughs> Like they like they, they, there right. shouldn't be a town square that is uh, privately owned. I'm not sure how you would go about um, having the government own it per se. But certainly if we can't come up with a scheme for some type of like, uh, uh, you know, Twitter co-op, there's no way that it should be big enough that it's this the town square. I mean, that's the, that's not that's the problem. Uh, we should be able to go. I mean, on. I think that's what go ahead. I think that's what Mastodon is attempting, not not a publicly owned uh, uh, Twitter, but a Twitter, you know, Twitter replacement whose um, ownership is spread out among lots and lots of entities, including some government entities. There are local governments already setting up their own Mastodon instances. So, you know, you don't have to um, have someone else verify that that county commissioner who's tweeting from your county is themselves. They're, you can tell because they're they're posting from the server owned by your county that only hosts official accounts that it's them. Uh, and and what that means is that you can have something that looks a lot more like our current town uh, structure, where you have public sidewalks and public parks and also private speech forums like universities or concert halls or, or even cafes. Uh, and it's not everything is owned by the government, but it's also not that everything is owned by one company or indeed that everything is private and owned at all. Well, let's 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 move into the um, uh, the. The, the sort of the solutions, because you do dedicate half the book, uh, essentially, uh, to um, to solving these problems. Let's start with antitrust, um, I guess. I mean, and, and you how would like we go about saying how would the we as a society say that like a, a, a Twitter should not exist? Or how would we go about saying that um, Spotify uh, shouldn't be able to uh, essentially um uh, exploit the existence and the labor of all these musicians to the benefit of very few musicians, but largely to the, um, uh, the, the record companies. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's an old joke that whose punchline is if you wanted to get there, I wouldn't start from here. So, you know, the, the, the story of Spotify doesn't start with, uh, some Swedish, uh, sociopath waking up and deciding to destroy the livelihoods of a bunch of musicians. It starts with the record labels merging to uh, a cartel of, of three large firms. And so, you know, historically we didn't let firms do this, uh, you know, up until the Reagan era, we had rules about these predatory acquisitions. We didn't let firms merge, uh, into monopoly. We, we blocked those mergers and our current FTC chair, Lena Kahn, who is a force of nature and a superhero and a first in a generation antitrust enforcer who's who's really back on the job with with a vengeance has said that future mergers are going to be subject to the kind of scrutiny that we employed from the New Deal right up until the Reagan era. So that's some of the problem taken care of. But the rest of the problem 
is that we have all these existing monopolies. Right. And breaking up those monopolies is a great idea, but it's a slow process. So AT&T, from the first time the Department of Justice tried to break up AT&T until they managed it in 1982, was a 69-year slog. I don't want to wait 69 years for Sony or BMG or Twitter or Google to be broken up. And so we need some, some other tactics. So in the back half of the book, we have all these tactics for, for weakening the power of these large firms, because the reason it took 69 years to break up AT&T is they were rich as hell. And they were really structurally important to a lot of different important stakeholders. Like in the 50s, when, when AT&T was about to be broken up, the Pentagon weighed in and they said, we're going to lose the war in Korea if you break up uh, AT&T. Now, they lost the war in Korea anyway, but, but AT&T got a 30-year stay of execution. Um, and so we need to make them less important. We need to make them less powerful. And the second half of the book really goes into detail on how we can do that. So one of them is, is something we were just talking about, what's happening with Mastodon, which is to add interoperability. To these services, these large tech services. So if, if you are required by law, as the U European uh, Union is going to require as of this month under the Digital Markets Act, to allow third parties to connect to your service and provide ways for people to quit your service, but keep their audiobooks or keep their address books and continue to message the people who stay behind on a social media service or keep their um, uh, access to their calendars or their other services, then it's just much harder to keep people locked in. If you can uh, get, get rid of your iPhone, but keep your apps or um, uh, get rid of your Android phone, but, but use your apps on, on iOS or whatever, then you are in a much better position. It's much harder for that company to abuse you. You know, it's, it's once, once you're locked in, that's how, they can, that's how they can really turn the screws on you. Um, we can also take away their right to block third parties from adding interoperability. If, if you're a computer user of a certain age like me, you'll remember when Apple solved its problems with uh, Microsoft, by cloning Microsoft Office and releasing the iWork suite, which has pages, numbers, and Keynote, where they reverse engineered all of the Microsoft Office file formats so that you didn't have to throw away your Mac and buy a PC in order to talk to people who had Windows machines. You could just use Apple's reverse engineered clone of the flagship Windows program. If you tried to do that to Apple today, they would sue you under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and they'd say you were a tortious interferer with their contracts and just all kinds of, of nasty stuff. And so one thing we can do is defend the right of interoperators to do unto Apple and Google and Facebook as they did unto all the firms that came before them. And, and that would carry us a long way down the road, too. OK, so, so wait, let me let me just ask. Let me just let yeah. me just stop you there for a moment. So is that uh, is that does that have to be a statutory fix? So this ability, you know, like I, I can write something in pages and I can export it to uh, Microsoft uh, Word and I can send that doc uh, to somebody and et cetera, et cetera. Or I could, you know, let's say theoretically, uh, you know, take my uh, Audible books and play them on, you know, uh, Corey's uh, audio book player um, by, you know, uh -huh. maybe a conversion. Maybe another company comes in and, and provides like a, a converter or, yeah. you know, all my real yeah. all my real audio uh, uh, stuff that I had from real player. I could convert into something yeah. that is actually not a virus or something like that. Um, the Does that. Do, does that have to be a statutory change or can that be it, a it could regulatory? Be regulatory as well? Okay. Yeah. So it could be regulatory. So, you know, under, under um, section five uh, of the federal trade commission act, the FTC has very broad discretion to prohibit anti-competitive conduct. We just saw chairman, chairman con or chairwoman con rather uh, uh, introduce a new rule just before the, the new year that prohibits uh, non-compete contracts yes, yes. Uh, on, on just under that authority. Um, one of our suggestions in the book is to prohibit non-compete contracts. You don't need statutory authority for that. The other thing is that, you know, these companies uh, are already violating all kinds of laws, right? It's not like they're, they're um, you know, Boy Scouts who figured out how to color within the lines, but the lines are very sloppily drawn and so they can get away with all kinds of bad stuff. They're habitual recidivists. They're, they're you know, career criminals. And, and every now and again, you know, the FTC or another agency, the DOJ, will, will investigate them, will uh, bring them to, to, to justice, and then will offer them a settlement. And settlements are pretty flexible. 
Uh, these companies don't want to end up in court. They want to just sort of walk away. And historically, the, the, the price for walking away has been a fine. And as, as we all know, a fine is just a price. But settlements can also require structural remedies. So they could say, for example, well, as a condition of the settlement, if you want to sue someone who you say is hacking your service, it has to go through a special master who determines whether or not you are um, just doing this pretextually to shut down interoperability or whether it really is someone who's, who's trying to break into your service. Like Facebook has repeatedly threatened New York University School of Engineering, who have a thing called Ad Observer, where Facebook users voluntarily install a plugin that gets all the ads that they see. And all that they're trying to do is figure out whether Facebook is living up to its legal obligation to police paid political uh, disinformation. They keep finding that Facebook has failed. Facebook is trying to sue them under Section 12 or, or threatening to sue them under Section 12.1 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, effectively saying that they're hacking Facebook by looking at the by, by keeping a record of which ads are being shown. And so, you know, if you had a special master who before Facebook could file a, a, a lawsuit had to just look it over and make sure that it passed the giggle test, we could inspire a lot of confidence in third parties who wanted to go beyond just checking Facebook's ads, but also doing things like what Friendly Browser does, which is another company that Facebook has repeatedly threatened, that allows you to um, see just the feeds from your friends and not have to look look at the ads and not be tracked by Facebook. And 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 to be clear, the the value of of getting rid of the NDAs are not are, are not just uh, the the non uh, non non compete. Sorry, the non compete uh, um, uh, clauses. It's not just the the three hundred billion dollar annually that that workers are being basically you know it, it, its impact on suppression of wages which they've estimated is up to like 2000 per worker uh, in some instances. And we're talking 20 to 45% of the workers in the States, but it also will open up the opportunity for companies to do, or, and for startups to do the thing you're talking about. Like I remember back in the early days of Twitter, there were all sorts of like add ons to Twitter. There were different types of like Twitter readers. You didn't necessarily need to use the Twitter interface. You know, there were people developing like tweet deck uh, that may still be around, but there were other versions of it that were much better uh, ways of sort of like reading tweets. I remember we had like a, uh, a feature on the show that, that Kyle had made that could people could donate one tweet a day to the show to promote what we wanted to promote. Uh, and Twitter basically made it impossible to do that. The having, non-compete would allow people to leave a company like Twitter and essentially create maybe more often stuff that would work with Twitter, make it better for a user experience. Um, and this is something that the FTC, that's the value of the non-compete. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because in, in tech, um, non-competes are usually not enforceable because most tech companies are in California. And it's quite a, quite a story about how California came to have Silicon Valley in it, which is that, you know, the guy who invented the, the Silicon Semiconductor, the, the person for whom Silicon Valley is named, was this lunatic called Robert Shockley. And Shockley became an ardent eugenicist. And he took his, his million dollar Nobel money plus a bunch of investor capital, and he went out to Silicon Valley, what is now Silicon Valley, to create the very first microchips. But he never built one because he was so obsessed with touring the country, trying to find um, uh, women of color whom he could pay $100 to get sterilized. And he became this paranoid, brooding nutcase who no one could work for, and no one wanted to work for, and nothing happened at, um, at, at his company, at, at Shockley Semiconductor. And eight of his top engineers quit, and they founded a rival company called Fairchild Semiconductor. They called them the Treacherous Eight that made the first uh, successful semiconductors and this, the uh, eight of their top engineers quit and started a company called Intel. And all of that is possible only because California doesn't have enforceable non-competes. And when you contrast that with other high tech centers like the, uh, uh, the corridor around MIT, where uh, non-competes are enforceable, you see that those are places where great high tech ideas go to die. Because if you have a great idea and you go to work for a company that's run by a monster, as so many of them are, then if you quit, you can't work in the field for another three years. And so that means that um, all the innovation that we're supposed to be seeking and, and praising, all of that stagnates. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, limits on copyright contracts. I mean, I, I, that, that seems somewhat self-evident, but, but, but um, uh, that basically just frees up 
Um, uh, I mean, that copyright was supposed to be, well, uh, uh, walk us through that. Yeah, sure. So uh, copyright now lasts an extraordinary long period. It's uh, 90 years for works of corporate authorship, life plus 70 years for, for works of individual human authorship. And those extraordinarily long live copyrights are the ammunition that these aggregators use to control the industry. You know, the reason that Sony and Warner and Universal were able to aggregate 70 percent of the recordings is that the recordings weren't entering the public domain. And so once they got hold of them, they were theirs sort of for the foreseeable future. Uh, that's changed a little bit recently just because we, we just got the first recordings going into the public domain a couple of years ago since 1998. Uh, and, um, and, and now there's a few going into the public domain every year. It'll be more soon as we, as we, uh, move forward in terms of the public domain threshold into the thirties and forties, when you've got a lot of recordings that are still extant. So we'll be able to release those public domain. But, um, in the meantime, these, these very long live recordings gave these firms, uh, the power to control the future of their industry. And the, the the thing is that they didn't have to pay very much to get those copyrights, especially uh, the copyrights that came from artists who are at the start of their career. When you're at the start of your career, you have very little negotiating leverage. It's it's really easy to screw you over. And it was um, uh, this was something that was recognized in the earliest copyright systems in the United States. The the founders' copyright, the first copyright that that the U.S. had, endured for 14 years but could be renewed once for another 14 years, but only by the natural author, only by the creator. And so if you sold your book to a publisher and 14 years later it was still selling well, your publisher couldn't maintain their exclusive right to it unless they could convince you to renew the copyright. And that was the moment at which you could turn around to the publisher and say, well, let's talk about what my share really should be. And so this was a way to ensure that the works that were very successful ended up having that success not just redound to an intermediary like a publisher or a label or a studio, but to the creative worker who did the work. In the 1976 Copyright Act, um, we, there was a, uh, in the original statutory language, there was a 25 year automatic reversion, which meant that if you signed a, a copyright contract, no matter what the letter of the contract said, after 25 years, you got your copyright back. And so if you signed a book deal and your book was still successful 25 years later, your publisher would have to come to you and, and entice you to renew the deal. And so that would give you some, some uh, uh, negotiating leverage, again, for those successful works. That was watered down at the 11th hour. And, and the termination clause that we have now uh, kicks in after 35 years, and it requires a lot of pretty gnarly paperwork. Nevertheless, it's been a huge boon to creators, um, the, the women who created the Babysitter's Club and um, Sweet Valley High books terminated their copyrights uh, and, and are now able to own those copyrights and, and resell them separately. So if there's a young person in your life you've bought those books for, you're directly benefiting those creators in a way that they were denied the benefit of uh, under the bad contract that they signed originally. Stephen King uh, re- uh, terminated the copyright on his first half dozen novels. And George Clinton, who was defrauded out of his copyrights by an unscrupulous manager, finally gave up on suing that manager and instead just terminated the, the uh, false transfer and got his copyrights back. You know, the reason George Clinton is still touring his music when he's in his 70s is not because he's an unstoppable funk god. I mean, he is, but it's also because he's broke, because all of his money was stolen, because his copyrights were stolen. And so we could we could put termination back in. The direction of travel has been the other way around. We, instead of making it easier, we've been making it harder. In fact, there was um, some must-pass legislation that a congressional staffer slipped uh, a single line into that no one noticed or debated that uh, took away termination rights from musicians. And this was so controversial when it came out and so outrageous that um, they, Congress actually sat down and, and amended the, the past legislation to remove that line whereupon that staffer quit and became the head of the Recording Industry Association of America. That staffer's name was Mitch Bainwall, and he's currently making millions of dollars heading up uh, the lobby that tells us that they are the people who defend the interests of recording artists. Um, And so, you know, we could make termination automatic. We could make it automatic after a shorter period of time. You know, a lot of termination is exercised by heirs. So we see the heirs of Steve Ditko and, and Stan Lee trying to terminate the transfer of the Marvel characters to Marvel Inc., which would mean that Disney would lose the Marvel characters, which would be a pretty interesting circumstance. And, you know, as as a working artist who has an heir, I have a 14-year-old daughter, you know, the idea of her getting some residual income from my work is is nice, 
But, you know, if we want to improve the lives of, of creators and of their children, the way to do it is to make sure that we're rebalancing the distributional outcomes while those creators are alive. So 35 years is too long. 20 years would be great. 25 would be acceptable. And making it automatic, clearing the bureaucratic hurdles would be even better. All right. And there's a lot more um, of these type of, 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 of fixes in the book. Let's just lastly talk about, like, how does this become... Uh, a movement like how do people talk about this sort of i guess basket of solutions um or the in this sort of uh genre of problems within the context of uh of our society what what how do how do they address them without having to sort of like go through the specific instances of which we're talking about so look, no, no two labor markets are the same, but they all have comparable or, or similar contours. So, you know, creators have some distinctive characteristics to their labor situation. The, the most important one is that the thing that's supposed to help us get a better shake, copyright, is really bad at it under conditions of market concentration. You know, giving an artist more money when there's only three record labels is like giving a bullied kid extra lunch money. You know, the kids aren't going to get to keep their lunch money. The bullies are just going to take it at the gates. You need to clear the gates in order to, to get that, uh, to get, to get them fed. So, um, you know, and, and creators also have what, what they call vocational awe, which is to say that our job matters to us and we do it even if we're badly paid. This is something that we share with, with a lot of the caring sectors like teachers and nurses and doctors. And you see similar tactics being applied to creators as are applied to those caring workers. Um, and so we have a lot in common with them. But, you know, we also have a lot in common with, say, Uber drivers, because uh, Uber drivers are also living through a choke point where you have people who want rides and you have people who want to drive. And then you have this rent seeker in the middle that's uh, sucking all the value out of the system and increasing the price of the ride and decreasing the compensation for the ride uh, and, and returning the difference to their shareholders. And Uber drivers showed us the way to solve this, which is that they organized, um, uh, even though they, they couldn't unionize, they organized collectively and they uh, were able to do something called a mass arbitration claim in the in California that resulted in Uber paying them $150 million uh, to compensate for stolen wages. And so it's only by reaching out across these sectors and finding the way that we have commonality, the way that everyone who has vocational law and is in the caring trades or the arts has the same contours. Everyone who's in a choke point has the same contours. And understanding that your fight is my fight, that we can make the difference. You know, one of the people we quote in this book is James Boyle, who's a copyright scholar. He runs the Center for the Public Domain at uh, Duke University with Jennifer Jenkins. And Jamie says that before the term ecology was coined, um, it wasn't really clear that people who cared about different issues were fighting on the same side. You know, if you care about owls and I care about the ozone layer, are, are we really fighting the same fight? Are, are charismatic nocturnal avians somehow connected to the gaseous composition of the upper atmosphere? Well, they are, but only if you know the term ecology. And then all of a sudden, those thousand issues become a single movement and it gets stuff done. And, and our goal with this book is not just to um, sketch out or, or indeed, uh, you know, detail, uh, give, give a detailed explanation of how creative labor markets were rigged, but also to explain how those are common with all the other labor markets that have been rigged in their own way. And the details are different, sure, but the cause is the same. Excessive corporate power is at the root of the immiseration of every kind of worker. And we all have the same fight. Uh, Corey Doctorow, the, the book is Choke Point Capitalism, How Big Tech and Big Content Captured Creative Labor Markets, How We'll Win Them Back, co-written with Rebecca Giblin. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Oh, likewise. I really enjoyed it. Let's uh, figure out how we can do it with video next time. I, I love chatting with you. Thank you. All right. Fantastic. Thanks, Corey.